G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Edward Rocher from The Morning Goals based in Boston, Massachusetts in the US. Thanks for your time today, Ed. Thank you very much. Let's start with how we know each other. So Podcast Connection reached out and thought you might be a good guest to, to come on the on the cast and looking at your background and your uh, business experience, I, I think the audience will get a lot out of our chat today. Great. Looking forward to it, Troy. Well, tell our audience a bit about your business. Sure. So the Morning Goals is a business and uh, life coaching practice and consulting service. And so I have a background in finance, I have a master's in management. Um, and as we entered the pandemic, uh, what is it, a year now, a little bit over a year, um, I was, I pivoted um, to coaching. Uh, I think there was a huge need for people who were stuck at home, uh, sort of in crisis, both emotional, professional, personal. And I saw an opportunity to uh, lean in with my business experience, uh, with my my entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, I started the, the coaching business through a free program uh, that was basically a goal setting program that I offered to friends and family and colleagues. And through that, then I launched the morning goals. Great. And that's, is that a mixture of one-on-one coaching and the online course they go through? Yeah, so so generally it's one on one um, coaching, and so the the my thought process is sort of like you know I want to grab somebody. Um, the cool thing about coaching, if if business coaching, what I do is I really get to work with with people's minds, um, entrepreneurs who are looking to expand. I have clients from the MIT uh, artificial intelligence guy to CEOs from large corporations to the small business, right? And ultimately, um, I know that the podcast focuses on small business owners and growing your business. And so one of the cool things is that I get get to see some really awesome products or services that are about to launch or they're picking to the next level um, and uh, and help them um, sort of, you know, I've realized that in coaching, it's not just the, the, the numbers game, a lot of times as you're growing the business, a lot of people get in their own way, right? Yeah. And so that has to do with your background, your upbringing, um, past failures, past successes, relationships. And so my job is to sometimes work through that to help them uh, grow the business. Yeah. So yeah, you, I think you're right. That uh, owners can get in their own way. They've got a, a preset recording in their head in some matters, um, and it's good to have someone external to help them unpick that and rewire that part of their brain. Yeah. So tell us how you started out. Yeah. So I come from a small rural community in Texas. I am a country boy. I may not look it or sound like it, but I am. I uh, got had the great opportunity to go to a small university that you may or may not heard of, heard of called Harvard. Um, <laughs> then, uh, and so, are you know, arguably one of the most known schools in the world. And so, left my small hometown community of five thousand people and packed up and moved to the big city. And my, my goal in life was, and I tell this story all the time, was my goal in life was to really just improve my life. It wasn't, you know, get rich or build anything. And I realized that business and entrepreneurship was inherent to, to sort of my DNA. I realized, you know, my mother, my father was a, a, a carpenter, my mother, uh, 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 arts crafts woman. And then I come from a family of entrepreneurs and we didn't realize what we were doing. Um, and so until like, I'm sort of analyzing why I got into business and what, you know, the, 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 the launch of my businesses. Um, so my background is actually in banking and finance. Mm-hmm. And so I let, well, graduate from college uh, with, with a degree in government thinking that I was going to be the next Donald Trump of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got tainted there uh, um, as, as I did my stint in politics and said, you know what, I need to learn how to make money, learn how to build things and started working in hedge funds and private equity companies. So that's how I started out. But my passion had always been do languages. Um, and so I built in college. Um, if you think about sort of the stories of um, Airbnb, if you think of the story of Facebook, a lot of these 
entrepreneurs started in their dorm room in colleges like Harvard. And so um, I started a small language company out of my dorm room with the benefit and the help of my tech friends who knew how to code with a, and my first company was bostonspanish.com. And it was a language training tutoring service uh, because in Boston, there's a bunch of white people with a lot of money who want to pretend they're ethnic. <laughs> and what better way to be ethnic than to learn a second language? And I went from $10 an hour to $20 an hour uh, to my senior year in college, $100 an hour. Wow. Mm. Um, then, as you know, as we get into the real world and we, as an entrepreneur and a founder, we then ask ourselves, how do we replicate this? How do we grow exponentially? And if I'm doing all the work, mm. right, then it's sort of like we're limited in, in sort of our growth. And so I developed a system called the Rolla Method. So the company's called Rolla Languages. Um, that was uh, the, the idea was to replicate myself and my system of teaching languages from a quality con control perspective. Um, and I hired my girlfriend at the time. Um, and I, then she hired her cousin and that's how I started the business, um, Rolla languages. And so we've been thriving. Uh, we had to pivot like, like everybody else during the pandemic. Uh, we moved online and then started a publishing company for language education as well during the time. So, uh, we leaned really hard in, uh, during the pandemic, um, which was awesome and was a great opportunity for us because we had one access to capital that we generally didn't have before. Um, because of the pandemic. And then two, we had actually time uh, to be able to carry out some of the projects that we hadn't been able to do in the past. Yeah, great. And what year did you start, Roller? I started 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and it started off and I, 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 you know, I resonate with some of your, the people you interview and, and the mission of, of your podcast and your business is because is that um, I started it off as a side hustle. And so I, one, enjoyed people, enjoyed teaching people, enjoyed the methodology and the creation of material. And I sort of grew from one client to two clients to three clients. And I know one of the questions you're going to ask is, when did you know you were successful or when did you know that this was a viable business? And so I realized that this was a viable business when I had hit 100 clients. Yep. I was working uh, in finance, um, in hedge funds, making $100,000 a year in my early 20s. Um, and I was like, okay, I have a hundred clients and this is a side hustle. I'm not spending a lot of time on it. I have other people who are depending on me and I now need to decide whether this is going to be a side hustle or a business. And I decided to, uh, leave hedge funds and private equity in my steady income yep. as a vice president of hedge fund, a uh, hedge fund at the time, uh, to go all in on the language business. And so that was really much right now. I'm a coach and this is my second uh iteration of of my system um and i now i just think i can do everything i did at rolla not content aside uh quicker faster and better funded and so when did you make the jump from the hedge fund like how, you started yeah. 10 years ago roller but how how many years in did you jump yeah, so it was about four years in. It was about four years in, and I had, I had, I, you know, part of it was that that again, I talked about business coaching and sort of getting in my own way and mental, you know, the mentality and the thought process, the mindset, the fear. Right, I had a fancy title, and I was going to go from uh, managing director or vice president to Spanish teacher. <laughs> uh, yeah. So right now, I'm the proudest, coolest, best Spanish teacher in the world, and I've yeah. leaned in on it, and I accept it, and it's awesome. Uh, there was a lot of fear early on about, you know, my colleagues, my, you know, again, my Harvard education. Um, and so four years in, I had some money um, from from working in finance. I had some skill set. I had a networking a network that was I was able to lean in on in the in the Boston area. I'm located in Boston, uh, and it took me a little bit to sort of say, you know what. Um, you, you need to do this because this is what makes you happy. And the, the story goes, I was working um, at a hedge fund called Duchess Capital in downtown Boston, and I wanted to open a satellite office um, of my business, which is located in Cambridge, which is across the river. And um, I, was, I saw we had extra space at the hedge fund. Um, and I went up to my boss, Doug, and I said, Doug, can I rent the back space for my side hustle? He goes, absolutely. And so for about a year, um, I had sort of reduced my hours at the hedge fund. And at, it was right before Christmas. Um, he goes, pulls me into his office. He goes, Ed, your contract's about to come up. And he goes, 
do you really want to do this? I'm like, of course. And so for that first moment in my life, I was like, no, I really don't want to do this. <laughs> yeah. And Doug goes, I'll never forget this. He goes, Ed, um, I'm going to do you a favor. He goes, I'm not going to renew your contract here at Duchess Capital. And I want you to, I see how excited you get from the language company. I see excited. And as an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur and I want you to give it a go. And you're, you're here. I'm your, your landlord. If you need to come back, there's a home for you here, but give it a try. And so I was kind of pushed that way. So I went home uh, and told my partner, I just got fired, I think, but I'm super excited <laughs> um, and I'm a Spanish teacher and we're going to give it a go. And so, so I think sometimes there's this push that people see the excitement. And I think Doug saw the excitement of my students coming in. You know, we had a product that was, that was a, a quality product. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, I needed some time, sometimes you need the push. And so both um, my boss at the time did me a favor by not renewing my, it wasn't really a firing, it was a, it was a contract and said, you know what, just give it a try and gave me space that I rented from him for a below market rate. Um, in downtown Boston, you're probably paying about $5,000 to $10,000 a month. I was paying a thousand. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. And I got home and right before it was Christmas, it was like Christmas, December 23rd. And, and I told my partner, Hey, I'm not going, I'm not going back to the Duchess and uh, here we go. And it was the scariest moment of my life. And that Christmas, I probably was more worried than normal and <laughs> trying to get distracted by the Christmas trees and all of that. But yeah, but that was sort of like how I sort of leaned in on it. That, that's a, a wonderfully supportive boss. I mean, if Doug had been an asshole, you know, you, you would have been in real trouble. Doug trying. is an asshole and I'm going to send this to him. So he's still an asshole. <laughs> uh, he did me a favor and I really appreciate him for that. That's funny. Uh, when I left PricewaterhouseCoopers, I quit and they tried to convince me not to go, obviously. Um, but my boss also said, you know, give it eight, give it 12 months. And if yeah. it doesn't work, come back. And uh, 18 months later, HR finally uh, reached out and said, we think we've got to terminate your contract because it doesn't sound like you're coming back. So that's really good. Yeah, great yeah. start. Yeah. And 10 years ago when you started, how old were you? Uh, so I was 20. So, so I say 10 years because that's sort of kind of when I leaned in on it, but I started the business when I was in college. So I was actually like 19 or 20 at the time. I'm 38 now. Yeah. Um, so it took me a while to get Rolla languages starting. So uh, 10 years ago, I was 27, 28. Yeah. Um, I actually, I know I look really young. Um, and so I, I, but I had started it and I was sort of like, inching around and it went from Boston Spanish to Romance Languages Institute to, you know, the real actual business where I had payroll, I had employees, I had obligations was, 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 was 10 years ago. Yeah. That's kind of why I, you know, how I get to that number. Right. And do you have any key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of both businesses, Rolla and. Sure, 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 sure. So, so Rolla, we're, we're right now. Um, so, so, let me kind of back it up a little bit. When I first started Rolla, um, I think my my the ex, my expenditures were about two to three thousand dollars a month. Um, I had uh, rented originally before I uh, used Duchess's space. Um, I had rented a ten by ten office at a at a, at the before co working spaces exist. We had corporate offices that were shared. Regis is the biggest one in yep. the world, so I had rented a space from there. So. So I think my initial investment was sort of like minimal, you know, uh, but got to about two to three thousand dollars a month. Um, then after that, um, as I kind of leaned all, all in, um, you know, we were running a deficit for a while. Um, I was funding it with the money that I had made from hedge funds. I bootstrapped it. Um, anybody out there who's a small business owner, my biggest recommendation and my biggest regret was that I did not raise money or even ha go to the bank for a traditional business loan. I never had had that conversation. Um, so use other people's money. That's mm. that's sort of my my moral of my Good story. Advice. Mm. Because you can go light years away. So if you believe in the product, and like I did, I went from a six fig figure salary. If I believed in losing that much money, then why not take the risk of getting a loan yep. or raising money? And I had I actually worked in business development, so I, I had the skill set to raise money and do capital and raise capital. Um, so right now, pre-pandemic, uh, Rolla was growing about twenty percent a year. Right. Um, revenue before the pandemic was um, close to half a million uh, dollars of revenue. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, and uh, we were about 35% off of that from during the pandemic. And so yeah. we, this year looks like we're um, on par. We're hoping for what, what everyone in the U.S. is calling the Biden bump. Yeah. Um, everyone sort of, you know, taking off the masks and going back to the real world. Um, but we also got an infusion of grant money. Um, which has been a blessing. Um, so I think we've gotten uh, about $100,000 of grant money um, for minority-owned businesses here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, we've used that money to sort of um, uh, push projects forward, um, but also um, you know, reorganize uh, the little debt that we had at the time. And so as we go into the rest of the year and uh, um, next year, uh, we are going to leverage up um, on purpose to sort of take advantage of um, uh, the, the opportunities that exist. So right now uh, we have outlived and outmaneuvered some of the other language schools in Boston. Um, and so we are now the biggest multi-language institute in Boston. So, so the, our biggest competitor, two of our biggest competitors um, failed pre-pandemic. And so we're trying to now leverage up to have enough capital to sort of take advantage of that growing, going forward. Right. And what about number of team members? Yeah. So for Rolo languages, um, we have uh, 24 team members, um, yeah. of which seven of them are full time employees. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're, you know, we're, we're, we're growing. We actually didn't lay anybody off during the pandemic and we actually hired more people. Um, but the cool thing about everything that we're doing or have done um, from a financial perspective, and I think one of the things that I've learned. Um, is sort of thinking out of the box. And so the pandemic has really forced us to sort of say, okay, language training might be boring, right? You come to my class, there's five of you, 10 people in a class, um, but how can we do it better than everybody else? Um, and we have a system. Um, we also have material to back it up. We've published a series of children's books. Uh, we've published a series of workbooks um, and we're super excited because that's also a uh, long-term passive income and revenue um, that even if we don't sell Rolla, it's sort of there and in, in enhancing the business. Yeah. Um, for the language, for the business coaching company, um, this is a product. So I spent one year trying to become um, uh, in Instagram famous. <laughs> Yeah, uh, as we all as we all do. I do not dance on TikTok, <laughs> um, and, and so that business uh, we just started. Actually, I sort of spent the year incubating it on purpose to create content. Um, we, you know, part of that is I, th as I said earlier, I think I can con content unrelated do everything I did at Rolla instead of ten years, but like sort of faster. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think as small business owners that we do. Um, is that we sometimes grow without planning yes. and grow um, from our passion in our hearts. Mm -hmm. um, because I have Rolla and I have an income and I have money um, the, for the, the, the morning goals, I was able to sort of sit tight for a year, practice my skill, get certificates that people want me to have, um, hire a team, uh, have two fantastic colleagues who are amazing yep. uh, that I hired before we started um, uh, launching the business. Um, and then we launched the business and I, you know, I had followers on the social medias. I had content on the YouTube page. I had the blogs ready. And so now it's on cruise control and, and we are uh, growing. I think um, last month we had, you know, I think $5,000 of revenue, but I'm, we're only working, you know, 10 hours a week, 15 yep. hours a week. Um, and so the goal of this business um, as we go, kind of proceed through the end of the year is I think we, we can comfortably um, hit 80 to $100,000 of revenue um, and then double that next year. And so in the whole process will have taken three years yep. um, and as opposed to 10 and sort, yep. of, sort of like that growth process. Yeah, great. And so <laughs> the, the two team members, are they full-time? So you're about uh, so they're both part time right now. Yep. Uh, the cool thing about starting a business in a pandemic is that you get highly educated people for cheap. Yes. <laughs> and so if you want to reorganize your team, cut costs, but invest in your team, and that's what I've, I I'm a firm believer. I'm not will, I'm willing to pay a lot of money. I am, um, but like it's off. We 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 were connected the three of us um, uh, because of the pandemic, and yep. so. Um, uh, uh, one of my colleagues has 
a master's in education and is a tech guru. And the other one um, is a military wife who's an entrepreneur because she moves around every three years with her family and um, has experience because she develops her business every single time she moves. And so uh, the stars aligned, the moon was bright, and here we are working together. Right. And roll a, a full-time equivalents about 40 hours a week. Would that be about 10 people all up, you reckon? Yep, yep, yep. Right. That's really good growth, Ed. Yep. And when was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? Do you have a, a memory you can pull out? Yeah, so so I think for Rolla specifically, and I tell this, it's more of an entrepreneurial thing. It wasn't, um, uh, it was, uh, I made the mistake, and this is a business tip for everybody, uh, and it sounds stupid and you've heard it all the time, um, but I made the mistake of not paying myself for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started resenting the business. And for about four or five years there, my, my assistant, my secretary made more money than I did. Yep. Um, and that, that was the biggest mistake. And so the success part of it was both personal and professional. When I said, you know what, something has to change. Otherwise I need to close the business down and I should go back to work. Yeah. Right. And about four years or five years in four years into it, um, I said, stop, we're going to close everything down for two weeks. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a you know, coming to terms with what we're doing with our lives and what I'm doing with my lives. And I started paying myself a salary. Yeah. Um, and so I'm the first one to get paid. It sounds very selfish, um, but, you know, we have bills to pay. And, and also I made the worst decisions in my life when I didn't have money yeah. Finding, you know, from a business perspective. So I tell everybody, pay yourself, you know, don't, you know, I know you want to invest in your business and a lot of small business owners who have five to 25 employees, um, they're probably getting paid less than some of their employees. Um, and that needs to change because ultimately, as chief marketer of your company, you need to feel um, the best you possibly can from a motivational perspective, from a visionary perspective, from an innovation perspective. And so paying yourself first yeah. um, will allow you to do that because you have less of that resentment, that anxiety, that anger that comes up. Yeah, totally agree, Ed. And the, another reason to pay yourself at market rates or close to it. So, all right, to carve some off if you, especially if you're raising yeah. equity and you, you don't want to raise as much equity, you might pay yourself a little bit under market. But the other thing it does is force you to really look at your business model to make sure that you're charging your customers enough rather than just, you know, going by lowest price, for example, trying to compete well, on price. So I am really glad you said that. I undercharged for about five years. Yeah, but I did. <laughs> we did too. I like 75%. And that sounds yep. like a, a crazy amount of num- number, but it's true. Yep. And you're right. It didn't, we didn't reevaluate that until I said, you know what, I need to pay myself a salary. And so, so what, and, and, it, and I'm not, you know, I, I you know, f- for what we do, you know, we calculate like teacher hours to revenue because we know how much the teacher's bringing in based yep. on their class of five people or six people or 10 people, right? When you're working on the business instead of in the business, you're not doing that. And no. so you have to make money in different ways. Um, but I'm, but, but that what we did under, we charged under charge for a very long time because I didn't realize what was happening. We, yeah. Yeah, we did the same thing late nineties. We started a web, web design development company and for years we were just trying to compete on price, which is a very common strategy. I think people that go into business, they don't do a lot of reading or research or get mentors to try, kind of change the, the way they think about this, build a brand, become a trusted advisor or supplier. Um, and it wasn't until our accountant said, you've got to raise your prices because he could obviously see the numbers um, and we yeah. weren't paying ourselves hardly anything. So we said, no, no, we can't. We're going to lose customers. And he goes, yes, exactly. You're going to, you're going to re- lose the right customers, you know, or oh, sorry, you're going to lose the wrong customers, not the ones that are, you know, lose the assholes and the ones that pay late, et cetera. And, and so we did, yeah. we raised it. You know, a few months later, he said, raise them again. And we did it two or three times before we got close to where we should have been charging. And yeah, so much happier. So same. And, and, and so the cool thing about me being able to incubate my coaching business for a year was I was able to understand what is market rate for coaching, right? Yep. So for language education and, and to, to what you just said, the point there. So for one-on-one, let's do one-on-one so we can have like apples to apples, kind of different industries, but apples to apples. So for language education, 10 years for one-on-one tutoring, we started at 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. We just only got to 80 in 10 years yep. per hour. Yeah. Um, corporate clients, 120. We try to sort of send the teacher. 
took me 10 years to figure that I could get charged $120 for, for you know, for that type of service. Um, I launched my coaching business and I'm like 250 bucks an hour yeah. done. Yeah. And they're like, okay, sure. No problem. Right. Um, and so, so, so I was able to sort of understand like what it, what is market rate? What are people willing? And then that market, I have not, no one's gawked at the price since. Yep. And if they do, I don't want to work with you. Well, right? that's right. And it also comes back to the right marketing, proactive, very focused marketing. So you're talking firstly to the right customers that are prepared to pay that price because they value you. And secondly, the language that you're using in your communication to, to engage with those right customers. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and it was a learning process. And I also think that you know, um, now that I'm 38, I would love to go back and restart my language education, <laughs> right? And maybe you and your business in the 90s, like things yeah. that we know, right? Oh, um, yeah, then, be a shit ton more money in the bank if we had got it all right. The time, all the time, yeah, absolutely. I'd be so much better off. But but here we are trying to teach everybody who's listening, hey, uh, we make mistakes and listen and, 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 uh, and learn and, and try different things, yeah. That's it. And what does success look like to you? Um, so, so success, um, is, so, so for me, it's actually not defined financially. Um, success is sort of defined by, so there's two parts of success. Let's talk about the business success. So um, for Rolla, um, success is defined as maintaining our reputation and continuing the innovation of growth that we've, we've, we've done, right? And so for me, um, my intention, my exit was never to sell Rolla. It's something that I see that I could do the rest of my life on a beach um, in Hawaii, teaching languages online. And so that was how that business was designed. And so for me, as long as we can keep everybody happy, I believe in building communities at, at, in, my, um, in my businesses. So at Rolla, I actually literally just got an email today, a text message from my third assistant ago. Mm-hmm. Um, she was my assistant for a few years, uh, like six years ago. And she, because we have created a fantastic community of human-based company, a human-sized company, um, she's like, hey, Ed, my new boss is looking for language training. And I recommended Rolla take care of him. Sure. Um, and so for me, success is that, right? Creating, you know, I tell all of my young people who work at Rolla, this is a stepping stone f- for you to do greater things in the world. And I want to be your reference for your next job. I don't yeah. want it to be a surprise. I want you to come to me and I want to help you grow. So th- right there, I felt great and honored that she's like, hey, she left, she moved on. And she's like, you know, Rolla is still home. Right. Now, I do want to sell it now because I, during the pandemic, I got two phone calls and somebody, a couple of companies like were like, oh, um, hey, we saw how what a great reputation and brand you have. And I'm like, really? So let's, let's kind of go through that process. And um, but success for me is sort of like creating a community, creating the innovation. We're doing some amazing, cool things. We're not a tech company. We're more a content-based company. That's kind of how I define Rolla. Um, and for, for, for um, the morning goals, um, that is my next phase in life. Mm-hmm. Um, that is something that I could make um, six or seven figures with on an ongoing basis. And, and I, I define my entire entrepreneur journey in three words being able to travel, being able to meet people and being able to inspire people. And so if I can do those three things at the morning goals in the next phase of my life or roll off, I keep it for the rest of my life, then I'm the most successful person out there. Number one thing you'd recommend a marketing fast growing business. Uh, number one thing for marketing a fast growing business. Yeah. Um, niche, niche down. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so if you think that your uh, uh, demographic is a 15 year, 50 year old white man who makes a hundred thousand dollars, that's still not specific enough. <laughs> um, and yep. so niche down even more um, to understand sort of like who you're actually targeting. And so we struggled at Rolla because we taught more than one language. And so when we marketed um, all of our Google ads and our Facebook ads, um, we didn't, we, we, we didn't, we had to initially the experiment was we're a, a, a language institute, but we teach seven languages. That was too confusing for people. So we scrapped that after a few years of doing that and not seeing results. And we said, we're a Spanish company. So any advertisement you see that's automated, it's only promoting the Spanish language. 
And then by default, we're tr trickling into French and Portuguese and Mandarin and English. But my money was more diverted and marketed into to, to that. Um, for the, the business coaching, I am a business coaching company for creatives. Mm -hmm. Creatives are a very defined market. Um, creatives are generally influencers or, or content creators on the internet. Um, and that in, in, in and of itself is the uh, sort of we weeded out by age. So it's sort of your 20 something who's making a shit ton of money. Yep. Um, and it's not Gen Z because that defines something slightly different than creative um, yes. and people relate that. And so the more you can niche down, um, if you're a flower shop, if you're a photographer, if you're um, a consultant, yeah, niche down. Yeah, great advice. Um, <clears throat> so anything else on funding, either of the businesses, it's all been bootstrapped? It's all been bootstrapped. Um, yep. Uh, the grants for the yep. language education company um, and um, uh, the morning goals is a little bit too new for me to need money right now. Yep. Mm. Um, I'm in the process of um, getting a traditional small business loan here in the U.S. So yep. right now there's some great opportunities that you don't need collateral or don't need a lot of collateral or, or personal guarantees. Low interest rates are very low here in the U.S., not sure in Australia. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's a great opportunity to get debt. So some people like debt and some people like, like equity, uh, debt gives me control. Yes. Yeah. And I maintain control of the company. So if you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? I guess that's maybe a roller question. Firstly, would I go into my industry? Um, if I had all the money in the world, um, so, so I would say, yeah. So my, my, um, so whether it's, I consider both education yep. somehow teaching somebody something and helping somebody some way. Um, and I think there is a lot of money and opportunities. Um, the pandemic, especially now, for example, um, has shown the weaknesses of traditional brick and mortar universities, yes. um, especially here in the U S. So why are you paying $160,000 of, um, of tuition to Harvard or to Yale or university of Texas? Um, if you can, get online and go to places like Rolla Languages and pay $225 for a quality education. Um, and we're trained to teach you online, right? Yep. The brick and mortar schools are not. Um, and so, so from a, from a, I think a value perspective, there's a lot of money to be made in education uh, from a technology. So education, technology, ed tech, um, there's a lot of large investments. So what I tell everybody, look at everybody who we come in contact with has been educated by somebody. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the value, whether it's books or teachers or schools. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I would say yes. Can you, outline, way, <laughs> can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? My most stressful point uh, was at Rolla Languages and we didn't have we were running out of money. Um, and the my partner, um, Brian, my uh, assistant and I called him the Bank of Brian, and he bankrolled us for about six months um, by writing five to ten thousand dollar checks so that we could pay bills. Yeah. Um, and again, when you don't have money, um, you your survival um, uh, instinct kicks in, but in my opinion, it blinds the objectivity that you need to do to make the right decisions because you're 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 just trying to survive and you're just taking every, you're saying yes to everything, but you're not sort of your filter uh, as as a businessman or woman is not there. You're not filtering out what's what's objectively needs to happen for the business. Um, and I I remember um, you know literally. Um, my two assistants at the time saying, oh, you can pay us in a month or two months. I'm like, no, you need to take the money and cash it as quick as possible because we may not you know, have money and you, you know, you know, I know you have rent. Uh, and that was early on. That was like sort of year two or three or four, or sort of early on in, the, in that first part of the business. Um, and and it, it's a scary thing. But again, um, I do think that had I sort of paid myself first, worked in the business a little bit longer. I think I sort of stepped out of business a little too quickly at the time. Um, I would have sort of understood the needs of the business. So I went from, again, making six figures in a hedge fund, having money, having a budget that was given to me, working in my business, and then saying, oh, I can step out of it 
in year two or three um, and hire people. And that wasn't the case. That wasn't where we were at. And so, so um, uh, I look back at that time and sort of, it was, it was, I can't believe that these people stuck with me yep. <laughs> um, and uh, they did. And, and here we are, we're still, we're still growing. So what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Content for us for for role. so we're doing again. I'm again back to say this a, a third time is I think I can replicate what I did at Rolla just faster, um, and so we have spent time with content. So we are a service based business, and I need to have content. And so Rolla has turned itself into during the pandemic into a publishing company. Uh, we have published nine books across three different series. Um, and um, I'm going to be able to do that um, for the morning goals. That's the intention is to turn us into a publishing company. And then instead of publishing language books, we're going to be publishing self-help improvement books for, for entrepreneurs and business people and people who want life coaches and self-improvement. Um, and I'm going to do that way quicker. And so I think that that content um, is important for our type of business. Um, and there's a, a I, I saw a quote that says, um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a coach and don't have a book, you're like driving without a seatbelt type of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like, you know, that expertise of, you know, that, that, that you can use to not just make passive income, but to show your expertise is important. What have you enjoyed least about managing fast growth? Um, the, 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 the least, so the, the biggest concern of growing fast um, is that you as the owner and founder uh, become um, removed from the business. So you go from being a human-sized, community-oriented business where you care about your employees and you care about your, your clients uh, to a cold, viewed as a cold corporate um, company that is heartless. Yep. Um, and for me, it's been really hard, especially for Rolla, um, the language company, um, to step out of it so that I could work on it. But when I'm not in it, it's hard for people to feel my energy and my positivity and my motivation and to build that community. And so how do you do that when you're not there on a regular basis or not there uh, working on it with your colleagues? And so, you know, I was interviewed a few weeks ago talking about sort of your business philosophy. And, and, and right now, um, because a lot of us are still working from home, um, how do organizations um, uh, create a community within their, their companies across right, miles and miles and miles and stuff, right? Because you're no longer in the office. Um, and that's a, something that some of these big corporations are struggling with um, is, uh, because we're working off from home. Yeah. So I read something the other day, a stat that uh, I think 81% of, this might've been just here in Australia, but 81% of people want to continue working at home. They don't want to go back into the office. That's huge. Yeah, no, yeah. So, so, so I, um, I have had calls of people who know their office is empty saying, can I work in your office? <laughs> um, so I see it both ways. I do think that, um, that we're going to see a shift in how we work. Yes. Um, I am, I am more efficient because I'm not wasting two or three hours of my time in traffic. Yeah. Right. Um, and I am happier because you see this couch behind me. Yep. Um, I need a 10 minute break. I'm not, there's not a judgment of being <laughs> sort of sitting down and lounging a little bit. Right. Yep. Um, and I think that there is going to be a shift in how we um, uh, work. And I think working from home and um, is not a bad thing. And I think ultimately when we talk about, as we grow a business um, I've never met any uh, no small business has ever told me that the cost of doing business has gone down as no. they've started their business, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of taxes and taxes and regulations and um, your rent is going up, you know, 3% or 6% a year, right? So this may be an opportunity for people to shift a little bit. Yeah. And what do you love most about growing a small business? So what I love most about growing is sort of, it's a, it's a so I'm a, I'm a creative, I'm an artist. Um, but I also, and, and I'm an entrepreneur, but I like to see things grow. And so as you grow your small business, 
Um, we just did a, for the first time in, in 10 years for Rolla, we did a massive renovation um, during the pandemic because the offices were empty, our neighbors weren't there and we had money and we were able to do it. Um, so not only were we able to build um, with intentionality, um, but we were able to plan for our future success. And I think that for growing a business, um, once you are able to have money and, 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 and have positive cash flow and have growing revenue, that you know, um, it's awesome to be able to see that, that tangible growth, right? And this is, again, back, back to any type of small business, um, whether it's hiring a, another person, that's tangible, you see it. Whether it's getting a bigger space, uh, whether it's being able to buy more product, whether it's being able to offer more hours of service, those are all things that I think are, are motivating for us. What's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Um, let me see, how can I say this? Um, uh, the, 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 I was going to say something vulgar, but I don't want to say. I That's okay. Say, I swear all the time. So the audience is uh, it. <laughs> No, but I, I think, I, I think, I think the, the lack, I was going to say, don't, don't put this at, no, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I'm going to say um, the confidence, being able to say, you know what, this is what I have to offer, take it or leave it. Yeah. Um, when we start, when you start a business, there's a, 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 everybody experiences an initial fear and you think you need to take all the clients you can get to come into the door because mm-hmm. you have built a, uh, I, the shift in mindset was like, Hey, if you don't like my product, there's the door, right? Yeah. But not, not, not necessarily say it. And so, so, um, if I use Rolla as an example, um, Rolla is what I call the cool hippie, um, community-based grunge language company. Yeah, uh, people like us for that. Um, we tried to shift to become the corporate language company. People hated us for that, and we didn't do it well. Um, and so I, you know, I think that mindset was sort of like I realized, like, oh, this is our product. This is what people like about us because we do a great job and we are are um, uh, uh, personable. And so when I was able to say, hey, you know what? It's, this, is, this isn't a fit for you. We're not, we as a business are not a fit for you, but our competitor, I know they do a great job. Like it might be, it's more corporate. Like, I think that's what you're looking for. Um, that was a very empowering moment for us. And I think that as business owners, when, for example, for the, the, co- the coaching business, I don't give discounts. Yeah. It is what it is. And so we get, I get to pick my clients and that sounds very selfish. Of course, I want to save the world. I do a lot of charity work. I do a lot of community work. I'm on nonprofits. Um, but the more money I have, the more people I can help exactly. and the more people I can employ. Right. And so I think that was a huge mindset from me growing in my business and sort of getting some level of wealth and yeah. success. Yeah. What's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Know your numbers. Yeah, hallelujah. Uh, uh, um, I'm a numbers hey, guy too, like you. Oh, uh, uh, no, no, know your numbers, and because then you don't realize. So I think I think as we pay the bills, um, we sort of ignore what's happening when we're fearful of of what might be happening. Um, and I I remember about three or four years ago, we spent about ten thousand dollars hiring a forensic accountant to redo the books in the past right? Uh, because I was too scared to do them when I, when I was living in the moment. Yeah. And that was like our biggest, biggest mistake. And so I tell everybody, if you're starting a business, um, you make sure you talk to an accountant, you go to the bank, you make sure you have everything streamlined, you have whether it's spreadsheets or QuickBooks or another software like you, you like and you print that report and you look at it every Friday or every Monday to know your numbers and know where you're at. And, and if, if you don't know that you're negative $70,000 going into this quarter, then you're never going to be able to get, get dig out of the hole and strategize. Right. Yeah. And so, I think and I think it also has to do with personal finance. And, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of small business owners, true small business owner, right. In the, in the United States, we define small business as 500 employees or less. <laughs> right. Uh, um, and so true small business owners, which is that five employee, one employee to 25, um, 
are working to make money and pay the bills. And there is a reality that to that and the truth to that. So start from that truth that you're working to pay the bills, number one. Um, it's not to save the world. It's not to help people. Um, and if you start, and I do work, this is that mindset I use in coaching, right? So I'm like, why do you want to start this business? Oh, I want to help people. I'm, well, go be a volunteer. No, well, I, I, I often say that. Uh, I actually said that to someone, my second cousin that I was coaching the, the other day because they've got to <clears throat> open another hair salon. Obviously, I'll never use the product, but um, and the, <laughs> the new business partner isn't isn't very uh, <clears throat> entrepreneurial or business minded. And they did the fit out. Her husband's a builder and they didn't include that. They didn't charge for that time. I said, no, we raised it a few months ago. I said, talk to your business partner. She was more than understanding and fine. Yeah, he should be paid for that time. Raised it again last week. She said, oh, yeah, we, Sam and I kind of feel, you know, we're not going to charge, you know, it's just, that's the kind of people we are. And I said, um, well, not on my watch. If you, if you want to do that, go and start off. You, you and Sam can go and start a fucking charity, but you've got a business to run here. You know, you've got to make sure that you're, you're getting paid for what you're doing. Right, absolutely, and you might you might be the best hairstylist or, or or barber in Australia, but if you're not making money, you can't keep the doors open, right? Yeah. And, and that's a reality, and you can't hire people. and And I think that um, they're good people who start businesses, right? And and I think they're good people who have great intentions. Um, and so one of my mentors, who was my first boss at my first hedge fund, said, "Ed, I know you want to save the world, but you're poor." Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely poor. Um, but you, but I want to work with me for four years and I'm going to teach you how to make money. Um, and let's use this as an example. When you go and help the world, it, you have eight hours in a day, maybe 10. Um, I, I'm, I'm worth $50 million. And he sat me in his living room. He told me this um, when I was 18, 18 or 19. No, no, I was, I was a little bit older. I was like maybe 20. And he goes, I can write a check for a million dollars. And who has bigger impact me or you? <laughs> it's a great story. Yeah. Oh my God, you're right. And, yeah. and so, so we have to start from that truth of like, you're starting the business to make money. Yes. And then you can help people. That's right. Yep. Absolutely. I um, talk with uh, socialists thinking about getting into business on that point all the time. Yeah. Be the change you want to see in your business. Become more productive and less stressed with our free Transform Your Performance online course. Once you see the benefits, put your entire team through the course at no cost. We start out by telling you the secret to guaranteed success. Then over 100 lessons help you be more focused, present, productive, and feel more in control about work. GrowASmallBusiness.com Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Teams. Yep. Yeah. So, 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 um, you know, I think that hiring people and, and building teams, I do that very well. I attract talent. I don't pay them a lot of money. And then I, I, I sort of form them and then I help them move on to the next phase of their life, but they're still cheerleaders of my business. So I don't always, I don't, I don't, they're not quitting and, and I'm starting over. They're sort of helping me train the replacement and find the replacement. And that's sort of what I've built. Um, I would say that as you build your team, um, do two things. One, when you're a, a true small business, one person can ruin your whole yep. team team if spirit. They're, if they're toxic or an asshole. Yes. Yeah. And what my biggest mistake was not firing people when I should have. Yeah. Um, and I think that anybody out there listening to this, if your gut says you need to let this go, this person go on yep, day one it. or day 100, you yep. need to do it, move on, take your losses. If he sues you was meant to be whatever, yes. um, like let it go. And I think that we, we, as nice people yeah. start businesses, um, you know, you know, we want to give people opportunities, but, but if you're, I think most of us know whether it's a fit or not pretty early on, yep. um, and, and don't write it out, just cut loose. What are some things you'd recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Um, uh, building a culture. So, so invest in your team. Um, I, I think a lot of times we, um, you know, if you, uh, if you think about sort of these big groups that have cult, like company cultures, Google and Uber and, and all these people, um, Facebook, they have campuses. We, none of us, we don't have to do that, but um, I think that two things, um, let people know that they're supported. Yep. Um, and on a regular basis, if you're the boss, 
ask them how you can support them. Yeah. Um, keep that goes a long, long way. So one of the things that is, so my language company back to Rolla, um, we are primarily an adult education business. In adult education, there is high turnover um, from a business from a, on the business side, on an employee side, because nobody grows up to be a Spanish teacher at night. Mm. You grow up to be a Spanish teacher in a school, right? Mm. Uh, number one. And then number two, there's high turnover in adult education because, um, you know, we calculated a few years ago that the average adult education learner, so yourself, myself, right, mm. business professionals, um, we have a short attention span and there's a short necessity or desire of what we're learning, right? You you picked yeah. up the guitar last year, you probably lasted maybe for two months. So um, the more you invest in your team, um, and so I had to ta- I had to figure that out. So, so I, I calculated that the average um, uh, uh, language teacher in Boston shopped around from all the language schools and only lasted six months. Um, I have had teachers at Rolla for five years now, wow. five, six years. Great retention. Um, that turnover. Um, I realized that the average um, adult language learner um, spent about a thousand dollars of language training material, whether it was like books or tutoring or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, at Rolo, we've calculated that some of our people have, have um, uh, spent anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand um, dollars because they've been with us for yep. six years or seven years. Um, but a lot of that has all taken sort of that investment in my teachers that appreciation um, and them feeling supported. So on a regular basis, um, I'm talking to people saying, do you have the resources that you have? Um, how, what, how can I get you those resources? And it's not coming from my assistant or the managers, it's coming from me as the owner. Um, and I think as owners, we sometimes forget that. Yeah. Tell Odin's how you've handled balance. Balance, work-life balance, business-life yeah. balance, corporate balance, all the balance. Um, I take, so I've been, so every job that I've ever had in my adult life has allowed me to take naps during the day. Um, and so, um, I, I've been fortunate enough that ever since I started my professional career, um, I've been able to take a 20 to 40 minute nap, um, throughout the day. Uh, now that sounds really funny, but that goes a long way because I can then sort of regroup and energize. Um, and I also have been fortunate, like people like Doug and my, my other uh, boss, Mitchell, um, family was their number one priority. Yeah. Um, and so they all taught me that family's number one. Um, and so, you know, there's no such thing as an emergency. No. Uh, people, I mean, okay, you're, you're bleeding, your head gets chopped off, that's an emergency. But generally, um, uh, my, my, my mother used to say it's kind of a little dark, but she said, if anybody dies in the family in the middle of the night, do not call me. It is not an emergency. Let me sleep. You can call me at seven o'clock in the morning when I wake up. And I'm like, mom, that's mean. She's like, no, they're already dead. What do they want me to do? <laughs> right? Very practical, um, pragmatic mother. <laughs> but it's just truth to that, right? What are you going to do? Cry yeah. with everybody else? Or you, why can't I wait till seven o'clock in the morning? Right. Um, and and <laughs> so I, that's one part of that. And then the family side of things. So like, there's no such thing as an emergency and poor planning on your part is not an emergency on mine. Yes. So, so I stop work on Friday at 8 PM or, or whatever, right? Not, not, not Friday, 8 PM, but Friday at 5 PM. Yep. Um, and if you think there's an emergency on Saturday, because you need to register for a language class, you're going to have to wait till Monday. Yeah. <laughs> um, and on chain, we're going to take care of you and we'll be there, you know, bright and early to make sure you're okay. Um, but generally, um, you know, if, and, and back to finance. So emergency at emergencies in finance, I've worked in finance and education, uh, in construction and now coaching in finance, there should be no emergency that happens after the markets close. If you're invested in the market. So why are people working till six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock or on the weekends, right? Mm-hmm. If you're signing a contract and negotiating a contract, right? Every, you know, you know, the negotiation stops, but nothing's going to be signed until everybody gets there on Monday or Tuesday, right? So nobody should be doing this. So, so I think, so I'm a little cynical in this whole like work-life balance because I believe that, um, and I work with my clients on a coaching perspective to protect their time. Yes, <clears throat> because that is so important. They're like, well, well, why can't you protect your time from twelve to one? Go for a walk and eat. Yeah because I need to see clients. Well, why do you need to see clients? Why have you asked them to, to, to see you at one and not 12? Yeah. Well, no, 
you know, <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and so, yeah, protect your time. That's, it's so important. We have one life, one body, uh, and we need to take care of that both mentally, physically, and spiritually. So. And how much professional development have you invested in yourself over time, uh, books, courses, podcasts, training and conferences, et cetera? Yeah. So Harvard cost me, a, uh, $15,000 because I was poor. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a master's degree from Boston University that cost me about $35,000 because it was a continuing education thing. Um, my master coaching certificate cost me about $6,000. Um, and I just read books and I listen to your podcast and I learned so much from that. So, yeah. so I, I think that, that I'm a life learner. I speak four and a half languages, half because I'm trying to learn Mandarin. It's been a 30 year process. Uh, and I'm still on the numbers. Um, but I do think that as, as, as you know, the, the best entrepreneur and the best business owner is the one who keeps learning yeah. uh, and, and learning from other people and learning outside of their industry. At Harvard, and I said this recently, um, the Harvard education system is, yes, you have your, your degree, so mine was government, but they force us to take classes that are furthest away from that degree plan. Right. Um, so, so I studied government, but I had to take science classes mm -hmm. um, because the whole idea is that, that I will be a better politician or government official if I can talk science, if yeah. I can talk, you know, bio, you know, chemistry and other things, or, or at a minimum understand sort of these different things that are happening. Right. Um, and I, I believe there's some truth to that. And so I, I can talk about any subject you throw up my way because I'm a life learner and I like to read and learn and, and push myself. Anything else on mentors or coaches that you've had you want to tell you? Yeah. Anything? So, so um, if anyone has never worked with a coach, it's my slight plug for myself, um, and you um, hire a coach, um, the, and, and maybe this is a segue to that perfect question you just asked right now, uh, earlier, a second ago, um, the more you invest in yourself, there's truth to this, you can statistically cut it up in different ways. Um, the more you invest in yourself, the more money you're going to, to mm -hmm. receive growth. So I, I use this example. So um, at the beginning of the pandemic, pre pen right literally December before the March of the pandemic here in the US, um, I hired a publishing coach um, and she charged $4,000, I'm sorry, $400 an hour. Um, and I met with her um, two hours a month. So I was paying 800 bucks a month for her publishing experience, coaching me through this. Um, in one year, um, so six thousand dollars later, right? So I mm -hmm. spend nine. No, what's well, twelve times eight? Do the math. You're, uh, you're, <laughs> uh, nine thousand two hundred. Yeah, nine thousand six hundred. Sorry. Yeah. So nine thousand six hundred dollars later, um, I published nine books. I converted my company into a publishing company. Has a, a publishing arm now. Um, I'm in the process of writing another six books. I've hired a co-writer to write my novel memoir book. Mm -hmm. um, and I would not have been able to do anything had I not invested at $9,600. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Um, yeah. And now I haven't made it all back yet, yeah. but I am 1000% confident that at this point, oh, and I'm going on a book tour in September for yeah. my, my children's book, these mm -hmm. children's book I wrote. Um, and so I would not, and I started a podcast because of her as well. And all this other, and started my coaching business because that was part of the thing. So I got yeah. way more than, than, than the value of what I paid her. And had I not spent that 9,000, if she had told me you're going to pay me 9,000 to almost $10,000 this year, I would have been like, Oh, ooh, that's a lot of money. Oh, why would I do that? Right. Um, and we do that. We sort of put this, this, um, uh, like one value and we think it's a lot of money. I don't know if you've read the four hour work week. Yep. Tim Ferriss. Yep. And he sort of says, cut it out, cut it down. Right. There's a worksheet in the four hour work week that says like, you, if you, if you think about it from a $1 amount, yeah, it's going to sound like a lot, but if you cut it up into a day, how much is it going to cost me per day? Yes. Most of the things that we have that have most value it, are actually only like five or $10 a day, sort of in the long run as you invest into in yourself. And I'm a true believer in that. And I think, um, you know, anybody listening, invest in yourself, do yep. the course, yeah, yep. hire the coach. Absolutely. And do you have a board of directors or advisors? I guess more for role. Mm -hmm. no. I do not. No, yep. um, we, we, we were going to start a, a sort of a, a, an advisory board. Yep. Um, and it sort of never sort of came to fruition because 
you know, whatever. And, and um, you know, if you have a board of confidants or, or people or, or coaches or advisors that you can lean in, I think that's okay, especially for small businesses. Um, and I'm, I don't necessarily believe that it's necessary to have a board of advisors. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, if we become a multi-billion dollar corporation, <laughs> absolutely. All right, we're on our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Hardest thing, um, getting your first client and then your 10th client. <laughs> getting to 100 then becomes easy, but that first sale, yes. that, yeah. that, 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 you know, and then and that's always the hardest. It is. It's a scary chasm to have to jump across, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Favorite business book, which has helped you the most? Um, I honestly think it was actually Tim Ferriss's uh, four hour yeah. work week. I, I don't believe in the four hour work week because that's not my personality. Mm. Um, I'm going to work way longer than four hours and I'm going to have fun on the weekends and on vacation and appreciate life. Um, but like some of the things that I learned from it, I no longer read my email and um, as much as, as, mm. as I used to, because I don't, because I was like, he's right. Like, you know, yeah. if they really get a hold of it. So, it. so let me kind of, for people who don't, haven't read it in, in it, he says, you know, you can, train people to say, I'm only going to read my email Friday at 5 p.m. Yeah. And if you really want to get a hold of me, you will keep bothering me until you get a hold of me. If not, then it's not a, an emergency or necessity. There is so much truth to that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and so I do check my email like once a day. Yeah. Um, I, and there's, I have not missed anything in the yeah. last four years that I read that in book. Um, I also hired a virtual assistant based on the book. He talked about outsourcing mm -hmm our tasks and emails and uh, relationships you outsource you know um, I have a partner and uh, my assistant uh, Jeet in India who's fantastic sends love messages from time to time on my behalf yeah. <laughs> when I forget um, and <laughs> right. um, but yeah so I, I got those two tips actually from from yeah. that and, and um, yeah great any podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development um, so I listen to my own podcast called the yep. future break Dot com. It's everything you have to break up in life to move ahead. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, love to have you on as a guest because yeah. uh, all of us have had to break up with something, yep. whether it's ourselves or um, uh, people or habits, drinking, drugs, you know, yep. all the, all, you know, all kinds of things. Um, and and I, I think that, learn, you know, um, uh, you know, that the, the other podcast that I listened to is actually, um, and I forget the name of the woman and it's here, but I'm not going to look um, is basically she's a, a, a online saleswoman, uh, ad, ads person. She has a marketing agency um, and she brings on people much like yourself. And all she wants to know is numbers. Right. Yeah. So tell me right now how much you're paying yourself right now. Seventy five thousand yeah. dollars a year. Yeah. How, you know, you know, how much do you pay rent? Um, rents two thousand dollars a year, and she may, and that's the only thing she asks them. I don't care what you talk about, but I want to ask you these real numbers because. Uh, um, so I realized I was way richer as an entrepreneur than most entrepreneurs because of her podcast. I'm like, oh, I'm doing okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'll find it for you, and yeah, I'll send it. It's true. Put in the show notes. I'd like to listen to that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business. One tool. Um, so my big, my favorite tool is actually. Basecamp.com. Do you know Basecamp? Yeah. So it's like, you it's started like, out as, as 37 Signals. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Chicago yeah. and Copenhagen, the two offices or two founding business partners. Yeah, it's a great business. And they were pretty much remote from day one, particularly because one business partner was in Copenhagen, the other in Chicago. Yeah, great business. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so I use Basecamp to run not only my businesses, but my life. Yeah. Uh, and I have a personal one. I have one for the coaching company. Um, I do some real estate investment projects and I, ha I use it to manage those projects. Um, I use it both internally, but also externally to manage um, clients outside of businesses. Um, and so it's been a, it's been phenomenal. So I think that's actually been mm -hmm. the best investment because with one login, I know what everybody's doing at all times and they're yeah. communicating with me and it's in one place. And yeah. Right. Final, my favorite question. What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Stop being a pansy. <laughs> um, and as we say in Spanish, grow some cojones. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I, I think fear, right? That, and, and so that sort of like, you know, this stop being scared. Um, yeah. And that, back to that mindset shift was, I think it was that, that, that as an entrepreneur, we live in, in fear of judgment, fear of ourselves and fear of failure. Mm. And if we can stop living in fear, 
um, then you can have leaps and bounds. And once I sort of like move that fear and compartmentalize it, yes, it's still there. And yes, it creeps up from time to time, but I sort of label it, and move it over. Yeah. Then I have been able to grow exponentially. Fantastic, Ed. Thanks so much for your time. I think the audience got a lot of value out of your journey and what you've shared with us today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And for our audience, we'd greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 